Hi, I'm Tim O'Shea from DeepSig, um, and this talk is a bunch of work, also by Nathan and Ben and Tamogna and Tim. Uh, so I'm just going to talk a little bit about uh, kind of some of the advances in radio machine learning that have happened this year, some of the stuff we've been doing, uh, and some of the ways we're using Kinney Radio uh, with our work and other open source efforts that we've tried to work with. Um, so we're a startup company that it's just under two years old. Um, and we're focused on software products. So our core team uh, is a bunch of guys that have been very involved with Kinder Radio and Volk and Userp. I think you've seen a handful of them this week. Um, and uh, our focus really is looking at uh, deep learning in the RF physical layer uh, specifically to, to bring about significant improvements in capability uh, that, we, that we can't do today, places that are pain points in today's systems. Um, and places we can, we can provide major enhancements um, where, where, where there's power and performance limitations today. Um, so really, uh, some of the work that we've put out there is kind of the early research in this area, and um, we're focused on mature software products that are kind of some of the first offerings you'll see, um, but there's a lot of interest in this area, and there's several other talks this week uh, that are looking at similar things. Um, so really, the, the whole um, core of what we're doing is we're looking at this kind of data-centric way to think about signal processing and algorithms. Um, and so rather than trying to come up with simplified models of comms problems, uh, we're trying to say, let's take all of the data in the real world uh, and the end goal and objectives and performance metrics that we want to achieve on that data uh, and learn this you know, really complex manifold or deep learning thing that maps our inputs to our outputs and accomplishes whatever signal processing task we're trying to do. Um, and so what's really cool is there's this huge uh, bunch of technology that has really been uh, accelerated and has made major changes in computer vision and natural language over the past five uh, years. Um, and so we have all of this kind of there for us to leverage and use in the radio domain. Uh, and that's really exciting um, because of what it allows. Um, right, and so there's really um, quite a bit of growing interest in uh, communications uh, space um, in this area. Uh, even within IEEE ComSoc, uh, they're really taking this seriously and starting to look at efforts around this and saying, you know, how can we really uh, take machine learning seriously and reconcile it with the kind of statistical rigor uh, and probabilistic forms that most signal processing has really always had. Um, and we can do that. Both of those can be married nicely together. Um, all right, so um, one of the really important things uh, when you talk about machine learning and radio um, is data, right, is real world data. And so GNU Radio is really kind of like the perfect entry point into radio machine learning because um, it's the way that you can really rapidly measure the world, pull data in, interact with things, test things. Uh, and so it's really a way to do things in the real world, not just in simplified simulations. Uh, and so it's a huge enabler for getting into this space and starting to work with, with real problems. Um, and so we've hosted a bunch of uh, things on radioml.org uh, that include kind of a bunch of Guinea Radio-based tools for signal generation, uh, kind of some examples to get started with classification and recognition, uh, as well as data sets. Um, and so we're putting up today the, uh, a, a pretty sizable uh, ModRec data set that's going to be 24 classes that are all actually recorded over the air. Uh, and so this was uh, from a paper we put out uh, recently. Um, and uh, this is, you know, it takes the biggest impediment to many machine learning spaces is data. Um, and so it's really important to have good data, have data you can rely on and that's been really tested and vetted. Uh, and so this is a kind of a data set that we put a lot of work into cleaning uh, and having be really something good to work and experiment with. So we're excited to kind of put that out there for anyone to, to work with that's interested. So this is just some examples from it. And a lot of this is, you know, using Kinney Radio tools under the hood uh, to generate these. All right, so, um, since kind of deep learning came in to the forefront in 2012, 2013 in computer vision, um, these systems have come a really, really long way. Uh, and so on the left you see ImageNet in 2012 where you're classifying uh, pictures of, of dogs and you know, 
single objects in a picture um, where you're just kind of coming up with, these are actually like a, a pseudo probability of each class being present in the picture. Um, and so we've come a long, long way to scaling to real world problems. So on the right is this uh, video which is uh, uh, borrowed from NVIDIA that they showed this year at GTC. Um, and this is, this is kind of the real problem in like a self-driving car uh, where you're, you're, you're pulling in streaming video, you're doing recognition, but it's not just recognition, it's detection and localization of, of objects in a scene and then classification of what they are. Uh, and what's really, really exciting is that these models can now be trained just from huge amounts of data uh, and labels and objectives. Um, and there's not really a lot of uh, hand engineering of features um, or uh, decision metrics or kind of conditionals uh, that you would typically have in kind of some kind of a decision process. Um, and so you can really train uh, these, these really complex problems just from data. And if we can do this for something as complex as you know, driving down the highway uh, and looking at all of these vehicles and identifying and localizing them, um, we can absolutely do this in radio for some very complex problems uh, borrowing from a lot of data. Um, so this is really the transition that we've been going through over the past year um, at DeepSig. Um, and this is taking kind of toy uh, radio machine learning problems and scaling them to the real world uh, and to real data sets with a lot of detail uh, and real effects uh, going on. Um, and so on the sensing side, this is taking things like, you know, single carrier modrec type classifiers that are just classifying a few modulation types uh, and taking that to, you know, full wideband recognizers that take in uh, wideband RF and they identify and localize everything uh, that's in there um, in real time. Uh, and then on the comm side, that's looking at, um, you know, in the auto encoder case, which I'll go into more in just a second, uh, that's going from like a simple Gaussian or an analytic channel model um, and scaling that to, okay, well, I'm in situ in the real world, how do I optimize for this channel uh, in the real world and how do I measure it? and optimize a wireless system for a specific link and environment. Um, so the whole idea behind this autoencoder um, is really, and I'll go through this kind of quickly, but the, the idea is that you are jointly learning how to encode and decode data for a channel uh, just by minimizing some performance metrics. So like bit error rate or, or uh, code word error rate are kind of the metrics that you can minimize. Um, and by doing this, you can kind of learn new modulation schemes. Uh, and what's really cool in this case, in the Gaussian noise case, it converges kind of to a simple canonical QPSK example, something that we're all very familiar with. Um, but where this is really interesting uh, is starting to look at um, more complex channels. Um, and so uh, you can apply this to things like um, a really nonlinear uh, amplifier and compression. Uh, and so we've worked a little bit looking at kind of the NASA Tedris Tweeta amplifier data uh, and looking at, you know, how can we um, encode efficiently for that channel. So this is just an example of training a comm system to send this super nonlinear looking constellation and then receive a nice cleanly spaced uh, constellation on the output. Um, so this is, you know, rather than thinking about things in the traditional sense of linearization and pre-distortion, you know, why don't we just solve the end-to-end -end mapping problem that our real system gives us? Um, and so that's really the approach we're taking here. Um, this approach is super general. So, um, you know, we're looking at all kinds of different applications of this. Uh, you know, things like satellite comms we just showed are very nicely controlled. Um, but the really interesting thing about this is, you know, we're all um, stuck with Shannon uh, and all the, the laws he left us with. Um, but uh, the thing that, that we can still optimize is when we have all these systematic impairments and distortions and interference, um, you know, we can really, really optimize our systems much, much better for all those degrees of freedom uh, in the future. Um, and so when you start looking at kind of future cellular and future dense uh, Wi-Fi, uh, and performance in environments that have, you know, very unique uh, interferers and threats. Um, you know, this approach uh, has really shown that um, we can really adapt and come up with some very interesting and performant uh, modulation schemes. Um, right. So um, the problem with all of this 
uh, is that we're still, in, in, in autoencoders, is that we're still relying on a model for the channel. So we still have this channel model, uh, which is analytic, and we have to differentiate through it to do these optimization problems. So um, Ian Goodfellow introduced this notion of a, um, a GAN, um, or generative adversarial network in 2014. Uh, and this has really blown up over the past year or two into a, a huge thing in machine learning. Um, and and the, the core idea here really is that you're, you're pitting two learning processes against each other. So you're, you're pitting a generator, which takes in noise and produces a fake image or a fake sample from some distribution. Uh, and then you're training a discriminator, uh, which is trying to tell between samples from that fake distribution and then real items, right? And so by training these two processes against each other, uh, you can produce a generator uh, which samples from a distribution that matches your training set. And so you can generate you know, fake samples that match some real distribution. In this case, it's faces uh, which match some data set of faces. Um, so, it, but you can now generate actually novel faces um, that don't match anyone but have all the properties of a face in that normal data set. Um, but this works in radio too. Um, and so this is one of the things we've been looking at for uh, training autoencoders uh, over the air. Um, and so you can actually treat this as a uh, adversarial problem um, where you cast the problems of approximating the channel uh, and then encoding your information to go across that channel uh, as an adversarial task uh, where they're kind of fighting against each other. Um, but ultimately you need to continue to optimize both to match the channel as well as you can and to encode for that channel. Um, so we did that, you know, put together with Guinea Radio and USRPs um, over the air. Uh, and this is some of the results for kind of the naive GAN approach. Um, and so what you can see here is that the channel loss, which is basically how well does my approximation for the channel response match my measurement uh, and the channel autoencoder loss, which is, you know, what was my bit error at the output of the channel. Uh, these both decrease as you train, uh, and it kind of converges to this nice state where you have a good approximation for the channel, and then you have good performance over that channel. Uh, and you can see that with totally naive case, you know, we've learned this really kind of pretty bad 16 QAM, um, but it's a 16 QAM, and you can get data across the channel that way. Um, so um, it's kind of cool that this super naive approach uh, that, that had no idea you know, what a channel model looked like, uh, can figure out how to communicate you know, very, very effectively, um, or to some degree. Um, so, um, right, but we can do a lot better. So there's um, kind of a major improvement on this that, that we went through and did, and, and the whole idea here is that you know, rather than just using a GAN, uh, you can use this conditional GAN with a variational uh, uh, channel uh, approximation network. Uh, and by doing this, uh, what we show is in the bottom left here, um, what you were getting with the previous method actually just learned to uh, estimate the mean of uh, basically the conditional distribution in the channel. Um, but if you do it this way, uh, you can basically learn the full distribution. So this is really cool because we can now take this uh, approach, we can go over any wireless channel and we can just fit this nice stochastic uh, channel model that, that matches all the uh, PDFs, hopefully, for the channel uh, so that we can emulate it uh, with the correct stochastic behavior to optimize for. Um, but this, so this is really cool, and, and it actually works pretty well. Uh, you can try this with all kinds of <coughs> crazy, weird channel distributions that you might encounter in the wor world. Um, there's actually a really cool paper from Andrea Goldsmith um, that looks at this over like molecular uh, and chemical channels uh, where she's shown that um, you can outperform Viterbi and a number of different kind of correction methods uh, using a learning-based approach. Um, right, but so here we're looking at, um, you know, a 16 QAM over a distorted uh, and phase noise kind of channel uh, and we come up with a reasonable um, approximation of it to train with. All right, so uh, on the other end of what we've been working with, um, really scaling sensing. So rather than just a mod rec, um, you know, you really want to take in a full wideband environment and quickly recognize uh, what's going on. Uh, and so uh, we have this demo running in the other room, if you haven't seen it. Um, and what's really cool is that, you know, 
Everyone who's ever recorded RF data knows it fills up drives really, really fast. Um, you know, sample data coming off of an ADC is a lot of data to deal with. Um, and so we have this fire hose, and if we want to do analytics on it, like, um, like we're doing down at the bottom here, where this is basically uh, cell tower strength uh, in Arlington, so looking at kind of transitions between different cell towers as we drive along. Um, and if we're interested in you know, anomalous cell towers popping up or you know, various other things that might be of interest, um, we can really start to do these sorts of analytics at scale now um, if we actually consolidate this fire hose of information into a structured representation of you know, what's going on, what was, was all the, the metadata describing the uh, emissions that we've seen. Um, and so this is kind of a really cool um, level that you know, we just haven't been able to really consume this fire hose at the same scale uh, in the past, but we can now do this in kind of uh, millisecond level, um, you know, significantly faster than any other method that, that I've encountered before. Um, so deployment is, is, a, um, is a big issue for every SDR, right? And SDR is really kind of unique uh, because we, we, if you talk to everyone here, I mean, you'll, you'll have SDRs everywhere from uh, a very low power edge sensor to kind of a high-end data center, kind of a class structure, um, and uh, everything in between. So um, again, uh, this is really a major thing. So in computer vision, they have the same issue, um, and you've seen um, you know, inference uh, going out everywhere from the edge to the cloud as well now. Uh, and so you know, it's, it's really a great opportunity uh, for the comms uh, community because you have this huge economy of scale now of inference engines that are being built to run you know, 2D ConvNets for computer vision uh, and to do this at really low power and really high inference rates. Um, and so this is a huge thing for us to leverage uh, because these are all you know, billions of dollars in chip investment uh, that we can just kind of take and it's already really, really optimized to run these kind of class of algorithms uh, for our SDR applications. Um, and so um, it's really uh, super convenient uh, to be able to take these class of models and deploy them across these, all these devices. Um, right, so kind of wrapping things up, um, you know, machine learning at the physical layer is really kind of starting to gain a lot more interest in the past year. Um, it really does offer some pretty new kind of departures and approaches to problems that, that just haven't really been cast that way before, um, which is pretty exciting because it's kind of a new way to think about things for a lot of problems. Um, and, and there's really, so there's this complexity problem in radio, right? So as we try to scale to, to many antenna, many device uh, problems, you know, we, our old tools for optimization um, really just don't scale to be able to take into account all of these effects, right? And so um, this is really kind of an inevitability, and you could see in computer vision the same thing happened, is that you know, tr traditional methods for uh, coming up with heuristics uh, and features you know, just, just simply couldn't keep up with the, the rate at which we can uh, use data to build these very complex um, models that take into account all of these, these factors. And so there's a certain degree, in my mind, of inevitability. Uh, this is going to kind of continue to enhance uh, algorithms all kind of across radio uh, and, and improve things in a number of different places. Um, so uh, things are still kind of accelerating, um, but I think this is really here to stay. Uh, this is not uh, kind of just the, the topic of the day, um, as it may seem sometimes with the, the hype around machine learning. Um, so, but to enable all of this, you know, good data and software infrastructure are absolutely critical. Um, and so Gooding Radio um, is totally at the center of like what is needed to enable this. Um, and so uh, since data is so critical uh, and real world measurement and simulation are so critical to being able to do these sorts of things, um, you know, it's really important um, that, that people can take tools like Gooding Radio and go out uh, and measure 
um, and simulate um, and vet these models against um, you know, the real world rather than you know, simplified simulations. Um, and then I think Ben's gonna talk more, but the SIGMF effort too uh, is a great effort to help kind of uh, help us wrangle all of that data into a form we can all share, uh, inter interoperate with all of our models and our objectives and our different types of radios um, and really uh, you know, have standards that, that, uh, that work. Um, so that's it. So thanks for listening. Um, stop by our booth and chat with us. Um, all right, thank you, Tim. All right, do we have questions from the audience? Okay, we have uh, Raphael and I'm afraid I don't, uh, Brian, or sorry, uh, Sebastian, do you still have the handheld? Wait, I don't see Sebastian. Yeah. Okay, I'll, I'll come to you next. Uh, so really good talk. Thanks again. And um, have you looked at neuromorphic computing or sort of these more optimized hardware platforms for doing um, sort of neural network computations? Yeah, absolutely. I think there's, there's kind of two classes of neuromorphic processors right now. There's like uh, spiking neural networks and then there's largely just vector accelerators. Um, and uh, spiking neural networks are really interesting and cool and there's been some really cool research over the past couple years in like asynchronous network training uh, where you don't need to do everything synchronously that actually might converge faster and perform more cheaply for some problems. Um, but largely we haven't seen a lot of the spiking neural networks uh, yet uh, achieve the same performance. So those are really interesting and they may be important in the future. Um, but for now, you know, the class of kind of vector accelerators uh, is super interesting and that's, you know, basically what a GPU is. Um, and absolutely, this is the really cool thing about uh, the situation radio's in right now is that we have many companies competing to build, you know, computer vision vector accelerators, and uh, we can kind of just go and use the same things for radio uh, and have this nice economy of scale that's already there for us. So absolutely, uh, it's such a fast-moving space now. All right, uh, yeah, let's go over there. Um, Hello. Uh, Tim, thanks a lot, excellent talk. Uh, I've been reading your paper since uh, a few years ago, and. Uh, it's good to see the, the, uh, some, of the, some of the recent work. So just a quick question. Uh, when you say wideband environments now, what is sort of the uh, scale of the bandwidth we're talking about and what is the limiting factor to going further? Sure, um, so what we showed there was roughly 40 megahertz, um, but there's no reason you can't scale that more. I mean, at some point it just becomes a uh, computational budget limitation and you're just going to trade off bandwidth for, um, you know, inference time. Uh, so yeah, there's no, there's no inherent limitation there. Um, okay. Uh, is that Raj? Yeah. Hey, uh, so how much can you tell us about the inner workings of the product? Like how are you sucking down 40 mega samples a second, pumping it through, I'm assuming neural nets and uh, what, what do the guts of it roughly look like? If you can, what can you share with us? Sure, so uh, we're publishing that uh, uh, roughly as quickly as we can. So um, we had a paper last December in uh, JSTSP that talked about um, using ResNets for uh, inference on um, single carrier. Um, and so we're using a lot from that approach but we're also you know, looking at what people were doing in computer vision um, and uh, you know, trying to leverage the, the state of the art that, that's being used there um, as well. Um, so I, you know, I think th th there's been a lot of work in that field f for the vision problem and for the self-driving car problem. And um, so there's really a lot of work to draw from there that we're using. <laughs> Other questions? We have a couple minutes. Nope. Oh, what? Uh, all right, Terry. Thanks, Tim. Um, what kind of processing power does it take to do 40 megahertz uh, to to do like the real time um, signal classification over a 40 megahertz uh, wide band? 
So, so that was on a desktop class GPU okay. uh, that we were showing. Um, we've been looking at it. Next, there's a demo in the other room with doing that on an embedded GPU, but it's, uh, it's kind of not quite real time uh, in that instance. Um, okay, so like NVIDIA type, like? Yep. Yeah, yeah. Um, we've been using definitely a lot of NVIDIA um, parts here. Okay, thanks. Was there another one? Uh, okay, go ahead, Bob. Yeah, so uh, have you, yeah, sure, sure. Ha are you finding um, that you're getting enough uh, data from uh, synthesis, or are you at all considering applying the learning with less labeled data work that's ongoing now? I think that could be important, but I don't have any good intuition right now. Yeah, it's super important. I think, um, and this is a big thing in the machine learning community overall, is it just, you know, how do we effectively learn with less labeled information? Um, and LWSS is cool because they're kind of really trying to tackle that problem. Um, a lot of the work with GANs has uh, helped that problem too, to say, you know, how can we uh, use less labels to better learn this distribution? Um, and you've got, this, you've got a lot of discussion in the past year over mode collapse in GANs and, uh, you know, uh, characterizing. Um, there's actually been some really interesting work that goes back to show that it's not just the GAN that has mode collapse, like the data set itself has a mode collapse in it. And so you can kind of show how much data you really need to span the full distribution of whatever you're trying to train. Um, and yeah, I mean, that's always going to be an issue. Like you want as much data as you can get and we're work and you know, you make your algorithm uh, work with the least data you can, you can do it. So. All right, we're out of time. Thank you very much, Tim.